I'm Dave Breckenridge, and this is Under the Dome. Alberta Health Services CEO Dr. Verna Yu has been let go. With more than a year left in her term, many people are wondering why the government has moved now and what this says about the UCP plans for health care. Meanwhile, a new poll is out showing not so great numbers for Premier Jason Kenney. What does this all have to do with this looming leadership review? We'll find out today on Under the Dome. My guest today, Calgary Herald columnist Don Braid, Mount Royal political science professor Dwayne Bratt. Thanks for joining me, guys. Hey, Dave. Good to be here. So, so like Alberta weather this time of year, Alberta politics is always changing. We had you know, planned to talk mainly focusing on the UCP leadership review, all the changes and the kind of the, the what's going on in the background with that. But Monday in Alberta politics, we, we got a bit of a bombshell. Uh, it was announced that Alberta Health Services CEO, Dr. Verna Yu was out. The government, uh, Alberta Health Services, looking uh, for a replacement. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people figured that this was tied to some some plans that the government had to make big changes in healthcare. Some people feel that it's potentially tied to the fact that we're kind of we're out of the pandemic and the government is able to make those changes. Um, other people feel that there's kind of more sinister motives about the privatization of healthcare and and Verna Yu being a big opponent to that. Um, Don, I'm wondering if you can kick us off here. What was your take on it? And I, I guess the big question a lot of people were asking is why now? Well, that's a good question because they don't seem to be far along with the search for a new leader. It could take months and months. But they, the, the story I was getting from the government yesterday is that she's got just over a year to go. She's been through six, seven, six, six tough years. Uh, they want somebody fresh in there because they want to reboot their whole uh, reform, uh, restructuring in healthcare with all these big issues, so like uh, uh, privatized surgeries and all kinds of other stuff. So they want somebody fresh in there who's really on side with the agenda. Um, there are some irritants between you and the government for sure over things like vaccination policy for health workers, and and the rural caucus had come not to like her very much at all. So there are all kinds. Of, there's some subsidiary reasons, but that's the one they give as the main reason. Um, that, you know, it, even if Verna was totally on side with all this stuff, she'd be going in a year anyway, and they'd have to retool somebody out, tool up somebody else to carry it through for the next number of years, all of which assumes they'll win the next election, which is not necessarily the case. But, but that, that I get is that, but, but it does seem really kind of, kind of bloodless to, after she's gone through all of this, she, she is a really, really good leader. People in the AHS think very highly of her. And of course, not everybody does. Uh, a lot of healthcare workers, some healthcare workers didn't like the vaccination plan, but she's very highly regarded. And with another leader, without her personal touch and her compassionate touch, that whole place might have just blown apart during the pandemic. I think she deserves tremendous credit for holding it together. And now these people and the way they seem to have of stepping on the wrong little spots uh, have gotten rid of her at a bad, a bad symbolic moment, in my view. Yeah, and, and not just symbolic moment. Uh, you know, Dwayne, I'm hoping you can touch on this. We're, we're a year out from a, an election. I know there's a lot of people in Alberta, in Alberta politics, that would like to say, well, we're putting COVID behind us now, but we're still very much in the thick of dealing with a global pandemic. And, and what do you make of the choice to get rid of the head of Alberta's public health body while we're potentially heading into a sixth wave of COVID? So Dawn was mentioning, you know, how well respected she is within AHS. And mm -hmm. she'd been there six years. But from the public's perspective, they didn't really know about her until about September, you know, maybe late spring or summer. And that's because Dr. Hinshaw was the face of the medical community when it came to COVID. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Hinshaw's reputation and credibility took a huge hit with her involvement in the Open for Summer plan. And so as a result, they started to bring Dr. Yu in for the press conferences. And it seemed to be refreshing. She came in with credibility. She came in with numbers. She came in with messaging and looked like a very strong, authoritative figure and really helped get the government out of a very complicated situation. But in the process of doing that, as Dawn raised, there are there were critics of her, particularly within the rural UCP caucus, about what she was saying about COVID. If you believe 
as many of those do, that COVID was overplayed and the restrictions were too much, um, then you really despise Dr. Yu. So I don't think we can ignore the timing of this as it relates to the UCP uh, review, leadership review. At the same time, let, let's think about this. The government clearly wanted, the moment that it was elected, to radically change healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. And you saw that in the McKinnon report where they talked about nurses' salaries and doctors' salaries, and they talked about private delivery of a public health care system, right? So not privatization per se, but allowing more private aspects that would be publicly funded. That got put on the back burner because of COVID. But now it appears that they want to do that a year out from an election. Usually you do these really tough, radical things at the beginning of a mandate, not at the end of a mandate. And so... There's a lot of questions about why she is being moved out now. And I think there's multiple factors, A, the healthcare agenda and B, the, the leadership review. But it could be months before there's a replacement. How do you implement such a dramatic change in the healthcare system months before an election? Yeah. And I mean, you, you touch on the UCP leadership review and, you know, it's hard to to want to avoid trying to link everything to to Jason Kenney's political future, but it almost seems hard not to in this case. You have, you know, the NDP have come out and saying that, that Jason Kenney is trying to placate extremists within his party. Um, as you mentioned, there's been some heavy criticism of uh, Dr. Yu from, from within the UCP caucus. How much of that comes into play here um, compared to the, the, the questions around reforming the health system and, and potentially just kind of trying to put a fresh face on the health authority, Dwayne? Well, you know, everything right now is about Kenny's leadership, every single thing the government does. Uh, and, you know, I, I completely agree with Dwayne. You know, Verna had become a kind of, you know, what, one of the MLAs, Dan Williams, actually, as the NDP pointed out, actually accused her in the House of holding a knife to the throat of rural communities and remote communities in, in northern Alberta. Uh, you know, that that kind of thinking was out there. Well, that, you know, we know where the opposition to Kenny within the caucus comes from, tends to come from that side of things, uh, which are, you know, the, they don't forget grudges. You know, the grudges persist forever in that side of the spectrum. And so, Getting rid of you now may mean a certain gain there. I don't know if, if that means, again, he's actually going to win more votes when people start mailing them in. Um, but everything has something to do with that whole issue right now. I mean, we're, what, five days away from what was supposed to be the big day? I don't know about you, Dwayne. I feel like a kid who's just found out the circus isn't coming to town after all. I'm very disappointed. I was looking forward to staying in a hotel in Red Deer that was as far from the fray as possible, but seeing how that was going to play out. But, you know, it, it all starts on the weekend with some kind of virtual thing. And uh, then the whole conversation is still going to be about Kenny because those ballots are going to continue to be mailed in up until, it's, uh, uh, what is it, May the 9th or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dwayne, for you, I mean, we're just a few days before ballots start getting mailed out. Is this the kind of messaging to UCP membership that, you know, Kenny is the guy we're going to we're going to do the big reforms that we talked about in the 2019 election? And, and you know, in the lead up to that, um, does this kind of change the channel for UCP members enough that, that Kenny can potentially use this to his advantage with the leadership review? Well, given the, the timing of that, they're, they're not actually even going to be able to start to design uh, a transformation of the healthcare system let alone implement it. There's simply not enough time between now and May of 2023. So this is about messaging. This is about, we're going back onto our agenda. So those fiscal conservatives that are in the party, um, you know, it's, COVID's over. Now we're gonna go back to what we promised to do in, in 2019 and, and 2020. And it's also some messaging to the critics of Verna U. Uh, and, when you think about the protesters who still are going to Edmonton and Calgary every weekend, even though restrictions have been dropped, when you talk to them, they go, yeah, but they're going to bring it back at any moment in time, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can't trust them not to reimpose that. Well, removing one of the people who is advocating for restrictions is a pretty strong messaging 
thing. So I think this is about messaging, not actually about policy, because they're not going to have time for the policy. The problem that Kenny faces is he lacks trust in two directions. He lacks trust uh, within his own party, um, and he lacks trust on the issue of health care. Remember the battle with the doctors in the middle of COVID. Uh, the, um, you're, you're seeing lots of people putting up online that, that famous health care guarantee that Jason Kenney signed. You know, and he's going to define this as saying, yeah, they're private surgical clinics, but it's still public health care. There's a lot of suspicions that people have, and you saw the NDP run right into that. So even if it was done for good reasons, people will look the worst because of the track record of the government. Yeah. And I mean, th I mean, that's been reflected in, in various public opinion polls about the UCP government and the premier. And we had one uh, just out this morning. We're recording this on Tuesday morning um, that Jason Kenney's approval is down, you know, all the way down to 30 uh, percent. He's got very high disapproval ratings and, you know, something like two thirds of Albertans or nearly two thirds of Albertans figure this the UCP should get a new leader, I, you know, heading into this leadership review is there anything really that, that Jason Kenney can do to to change public opinion of him? Does he really have to you know work hard to get out his vote with these mail-in ballots now, Don? Well, that poll of course is from Mark Henry's Think HQ group, and um, it, it's it's really quite devastating to see a poll like that right on the eve of the beginning of the leadership voting because of what it really suggests is that no matter what Kenney does or has done. His numbers don't move. People, it, in fact, uh, Mark Henry told me just this morning, it reminds him of the period in 2019 or before the 2019 election where it didn't matter what the NDP did, the numbers stayed the same and they were going to lose the election to the UCP and that's all there was to it. And now it looks the same, that, that Kenny cannot move his numbers. He's gone from 22% up to 30%, in disapproval up to uh, 30%. His approval rating, rather, it's so it's increased a bit, but it just stays the same. It doesn't doesn't break out. And look what's happened: higher oil prices, balanced budget, surplus, uh, cutting gasoline tax so people get a ten cent per liter break and most at most gas stations. All this kind of stuff that's typical Alberta good news when you're on the edge of some kind of energy boom should be moving them. But it, according to this latest poll, and and to be fair, we've had a couple of recent polls as well, including the one. From Janet Brown that showed that he was doing better and the government was actually neck and neck with the NDP. But there's this is the more typical poll. And it shows, despite all those things that are happening that should be typical Alberta government good news, great before an election, uh, he's not moving. He still, most people in the party and in the public at large think the UCP would be more likely to vote for the UCP with a new leader. And that's exactly the message that the many opponents of Kenny and his own party are are saying, even if you like the guy, even if you think he's doing a good job, we can't win with him. So what's the point, right? So yeah. this kind of poll reinforces that at this point. Yeah, Dwayne, Dwayne, for you, you know, Jason Kenny's got a reputation as as a skilled campaigner, uh, a scrappy politician. It, you know, someone you don't necessarily want to count out yet. Are we nearing the point that we could be counting him out, or or is it too early to say he's done? This is a discussion we've been having for over a year. Uh, when you think about other leaders, they would have been gone by now. That shows the resilience of Kenny and his ability to just make it through another day and make it through another day in the hopes that eventually things will, will turn around. But he's losing runway. Now, because of the shift in rules, because of the organizational skills of Kenny, I think he's going to pull out a technical victory. Uh, when we actually count all of the, the ballots. But what does that mean? I mean, a technical victory is anything over 50%. Mm -hmm. How do you hold this party together? Are the factions that are opposed to him, if he gets 60%, are the other 40 going, well, that's done. I guess we're going to have to support Jason Kenney now. I don't think there's a number where he keeps this party together because especially with the rural MLAs, they're used to leaving <laughs> and they know they can win on their own that they don't need the UCP banner. You know, uh, can a Todd Lowen or a Drew Barnes win as an independent? I, I think they could. Uh, could Brian Jean win with a brand new party? I think he could. 
right? So that, that's the challenge that Kenny has. And then there's a whole group of people who aren't members of the UCP part. And I think it's already baked in. I think Don makes a good point. The 2019 election, Rachel Notley didn't lose that during a 30-day campaign. Like the die was cast a year out. And how do you ignore, despite high oil prices, despite balanced budgets, how do you ignore 4,000 people dead in the province? How do you ignore the last three years? So I think Kenny will, will battle it out and he'll probably win something on May 18th. And then what happens on May 19th? And then what happens on May 20th, right? There are huge challenges he's got within the party and even huger challenges outside of the party. Yeah, and I mean, you're starting to see some of these challenges within the party really kind of cement themselves. You know, Brian Jean wins a, handily in a by-election. He comes in as a candidate who's very much opposed to the premier, wants to see uh, a leadership race, would put himself forward as leader. And you see people associated with him now making some, I, I, some accusations about, you know, underhanded ongoings within the party and and already trying to to raise an idea of distrust around the leadership vote. You know, Don, for you, is it a case of um, even if Kenny wins, even if it's 60 percent, even if it's more than that, that there'll be a lot of people within the party who say, ah, well, we can't trust him anyway. Like, is is <laughs> is the well already poisoned here within the party and the party membership? Or is there still enough of a base for Jason Kenny to carry support? into the next election? Well, the well was poisoned in 2017 with the, what happened in that leadership campaign. And that, that is, in my view, it's sort of like the, 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 the whole um, structure has been sort of tainted since birth almost. And now in this kind of situation, especially when Mr. Kenny changes the rules, and, and believe me, it wasn't the party board that did that on its own. That was something that came uh, with some political direction. He is the leader, after all, and he can mm -hmm. tell the party certain things. And they changed the vote. Well, that looks like uh, he's he's uh, fixed the voting voting base. He's expanded it. He probably has a better chance this way. I'm still not convinced that he'll carry it. I, 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 I think Dwayne's probably right, but I'm not entirely sure. I still, still think he might uh, uh, actually uh, not carry 50% of, of that vote. Um, so what happens after that? Well, you know, He'll still be under pressure to resign if the polls are as bad as they are, if they continue to be as bad as they are. As far as the vote goes, one thing I've heard from a half a dozen people spontaneously is the only way people will believe in the credibility of this vote is if he loses. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that, and that's not just a public perception, I think, but it's also a perception very much in the party. There's, I have never in all my time, like, like honestly, you guys, my first column in Alberta, a full-time political columnist, was April Fool's Day in 1978. And I've never seen a anything like the level of mistrust within a party of people mistrusting each other. They don't, there are those 33 writing associations don't believe a word the party president, party uh, directors and uh, party bar board says. They want the resignation of the party president and also of the executive director. The, it's it, there's really more than one fight going on. There's one one about Kenny's leadership, and there's other about control of the party that these people feel has been stolen from them by traditional uh, Ottawa tactic style career politicians, i.e. Jason Kenny. Uh, I don't know if any of that gets resolved from one count of votes on May the 18th. So think about this, Dave. He's already kicked out two people from caucus for challenging his leadership, for saying mm -hmm. we don't have confidence, we want him to resign. Well, now there's a lot more than two. There's still five, six, seven people within that caucus who have overtly called for the premier to resign. Brian Jean being one of them, Peter Guthrie being another. Now you've got Daniel Smith planning to run for a nomination in Livingston McLeod on a mandate of replacing Jason Kenney. What does he do? Like, do, do those people just say, well, we wanted you to, to resign, but you got 60% on the vote, so I guess you don't have to resign? Or do they leave on their own? Do they get punted? How do you control a caucus? And there's always caucus discontent, particularly with a large caucus. But if you've got people publicly, overtly calling on the leader to resign and you're still sitting there, I haven't seen that before. I haven't been around as long as Don, but I haven't seen that occur, 
right? So these are the challenges that Kenny has, not just April 9th or May 5th or May 18th, but all the days after that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then uh, if I could just say that the, the WIPA is a factor in all this too. Like a lot of people are parking, the people on the right side of the party are parking their votes with WIPA. This latest poll shows a lot of support for WIPA. It shows that uh, it suggests very strongly that if Jason Kenney wasn't the leader, a lot of those people would come back from parking their putative vote with uh, Paul uh, Hinman's odd party. Um, and, and so there's there's stuff that could happen fairly quickly if they did actually go into a leadership thing. And pe- Kenney's got to convince people that this will all calm down with increasing good news on the economic front and all the rest of it. But that, that argument gets more and more tired. Uh, as as you get closer and closer to the election and nothing is moving. So something's going to have to give, even if it doesn't give on May the 18th when they announce the ballots. Well, I know well, it's something that we'll all be paying attention to over the next few weeks. I'm going to leave it there for now. Dwayne Bratt, Don Braid, thanks for your time. Thanks a lot, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Dave. That's it for this episode of Under the Dome. Don't forget you can find all past episodes at edmontonjournal.com slash under the dome. And you can hit that subscribe button on YouTube. I'm Dave Breckenridge. We'll see you next time.